Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Minayo Nasiali, and it's a privilege to introduce um, our panel uh, entitled Disasters and Dislocation in France and the Empire. Um, our first paper today will be presented by Christopher Church. Christopher Church is an assistant professor in the Department of History here at the University of Nevada, Reno. He got his PhD at Berkeley, where I met you, Chris, many years ago. Um, I, uh, his PhD in Berkeley, 2004. Um, Christopher is the recipient of many fellowships and awards, um, as well as the author of a number of publications. Um, his book, Paradise Destroyed, Catastrophe and Citizenship in the French Caribbean, uh, is out. Yes? Yeah. It is out. Congratulations with University of Nebraska Press. Um, Christopher has also contributed book chapters um, and a number of articles, notably his 2014 article, Strikingly French, Martinique, Agitation Ouvrière et Politique Métropolitaine au Tournant du Siècle et le Mouvement Social. Today, Christopher Church will be presenting on rhythms of catastrophe, iterations of inequity, disaster memory, dislocation, and disparity during Pele's inter eruption of 1929. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being the intrepid souls who make it to the final panels at the end of a conference. <laughs> Uh, early on the morning of the 5th of January, 1930, Frank Perret disembarked his motorboat, collected his instruments, and hiked up the slopes of Mount Pele, the largest mountain on the French Caribbean island of Martinique. A well-regarded amateur scientist in the budding field of volcanology, uh, Perret had come at the behest of the colonial government to take seismic measurements of the active volcano, which had lurched awake for the second time in a generation. All too present in officials' minds was the fact that 27 years earlier, on the 8th of May, 1902, Mount Pele had defied scientists' expectations of safety after weeks of relative calm, and in an instant killed 30,000 individuals and wiped the once bustling city of Saint-Pierre off the map. Saint-Pierre had been once known as the Paris of the Antilles, and for good reason. It had been the cultural, intellectual, and economic heart of the island of Martinique, and a principal city in the Caribbean. And in the blink of an eye, it was gone. The grotesque nature of the eruption and the sheer magnitude of the loss of life cemented the 8th of May in the popular memory of Martinique, mainland France, and indeed the world. Two days after the eruption, the local press described it as, quote, dread a dreadful catastrophe whose aftermath had left Saint-Pierre in ashes, with its roof, quote, licked by flames and roads scattered with cadavers struck down by asphyxiating gases. Such harrowing narratives were taken up by news outlets in North America and Europe, and postcards displaying horrific scenes from that fateful day, boats tossed hither, uh, hither and thither, a charred Saint-Pierre strewn with ash-covered corpses, clouds of hot gas emanating from Pele. These circulated for decades throughout France, Great Britain, Germany, and the United States. By virtue of its horrific eruption, Pele had become a phenomenon among scientists and laypersons alike. Um, one that the island's population and administration never wished to repeat. And yet before the damage from the previous eruption had abated, Pele began to stir again a generation later, and for nearly three years, between 1929 and 1932, the volcano spewed hot ash and gas onto the northern half of Martinique, precisely the same region affected during the 1902 eruption. To contemporary observers, it was as if Vulcan himself had reawakened and now threatened to unleash his fury once more on the embers of Saint-Pierre. So as the Parisian weekly Le Petit Journal Illustré asked, is Martinique going to relive the tragic hours of 1902? Historical memory played a pivotal role in the public, scientific, and governmental response to the eruption of 1929. As the rhythms of the environment ran up against the contours of human civilization, uh, greatly overshadowed in both the historiography and popular imagination of the eruption of 1902, the eruption of 1929 
uh, illustrated the key role played by disaster memory in shaping choices made by historical actors during an eruption that lasted for nearly three straight years. In some ways, officials learned from past mistakes. Evacuating the northern half of the island, moving people and resources out of harm's way, and ultimately ensuring the physical safety of Martinique's colonial citizens. Um, uh, in contrast to what had happened, uh, occurred in 1902. In many other ways, however, French officials followed ruts cut deep by decades of disaster in the Caribbean, replicating past approaches to disaster relief that further entrenched the economic disparities and socio-political inequities that had come to characterize the French colonial world. Before the eruption of 1929, Saint-Pierre had been recovering from 1902's devastation, slowly but surely. By 1922, approximately 8,000 people had returned to Saint-Pierre's vicinity, and on the eve of the eruption in 1929, uh, the ruins of the former city had grown into a town of about 3,000 inhabitants. The city turned town of over 100 homes had rekindled the spark of quotidian life. Saint-Pierre seemed to hold the promise of economic resurrection, particularly because a budding industry, tourism, had made its way to northern Martinique as thousands of Americans visited the city and its ruins each year, often traveling up the slopes of Pele to get a close-up view of what contemporaries called the sleeping monster. The 1930s promised to be a pro prosperous decade for Saint-Pierre, as CGT, the main French shipping company in the Caribbean, had begun construction on a new warehouse, a new warehouses and planned to return Saint-Pierre to being the vital entrepot it once was. Martinique's rum production and the value of its exports was also at an all-time high, riding the wave of the Roaring Twenties. In the words of one contemporary, quote, today we experience infinite joy and immense pleasure to highlight the error so profound made by the prophets of misfortune who, in 1902, had found it convenient to advise the mass exodus of our compatriots to nicer climates. But it was not the prophets of misfortune who were in error, and early in 1929, the sleeping monster awoke. Beginning in March, the dome left by the 1902 eruption began to smoke as the ever-present fumaroles intensified at the mountain's crest. Undeterred, excursionists continued to venture to Pele's summit as its emanations intensified over the succeeding months. However, the memory of 1902, the 1902 eruption weighed on officials and the populace alike who know, knew that, quote, Pele's eruptions have a particular character. Uh, this character makes them highly volatile, rapid, and nigh impossible to survive. Because instead of producing lava that flows down the sides of a mountain, Pele's eruptions produce, quote, gaseous explosions that horizontally throw masses of hot ash and, and water vapor. These are known as nuées ardentes. Uh, with such great speed as to preclude any advance warning. Officials in the scientific community warned that, quote, in the current state of science, it would not be possible to presage the moment when Nuée Ardente uh, would form, and the eruption would consequently turn deadly. Uh, when activity increased in September of 1929, it seemed that officials' worst fears might come to pass. Uh, on the eve of September 16th, a violent volcanic thrust punctuated the relative calm that had existed between March and September, leading to what the Colonial, General, uh, Colonial Inspector General described as a panic grounded in the remembrance of the past disaster. The now fully awakened volcano blew off its dome and began to erupt outright. These eruptions continued intermittently with variable frequency. When Pele erupted for the sixth time in two weeks, producing flashes of light visible for miles, uh, the island's population grew increasingly alarmed. According to Jean Romer, uh, the a meteorologist assigned to Martinique, the emotion was, quote, profound. Uh, we still remembered the terrible catastrophe which 27 years earlier had annihilated Saint-Pierre and took more than 30,000 victims. So those tourists, those excursionists who had been going up to the top of the mountain now had very concrete reasons to worry. In fact, one of the tourist shelters known as La Brimouté, uh, a cement shelter named after the governor who uh, lost his life in the previous eruption having stayed in Saint-Pierre itself, uh, had its roof pierced by about 50 hot stones that were thrown at very high speeds from the mountain's crater. This led to news reports in October that readily recalled the previous eruption as some outlets hungrily ran full feature articles with images of the city's previously grotesque destruction. Uh, 
One article featured the eyewitness testimony of a journalist who had been stationed in Saint-Pierre in May 1902 uh, and who had warned how despite, quote, a radiant and absolutely clear sky except directly above Mount Pelé, um, Martinique would become the theater of the disaster only 48 hours later. So with anxiety mounting, the article explained, quote, the tragic memory of, two, of 27 years ago understandably threw the population into alarm. Now, Pele's resurging manifestations led officials to worry that a new uh, would could be imminent, uh, could be rolling down the mountain. So with maps illustrating the limits of the volcano's the devastation in the 1902 eruption, the government evacuated Saint-Pierre and its, in its environs. Uh, at the government's urging, locals were in fact quick to leave, bringing what they could carry and leaving the rest in order to avoid the fate of their friends and relatives just a generation before. Um, as officials wrote, a large portion of the population remembered without doubt the terrible events of 1902. And this led to approximately 10,000 refugees evacuating the foothills and countryside around Pele. Evacuate, evacuees were sheltered in public buildings, namely schools and town halls, as well as refugee encampments across the island. About 7,700 went to these official refugee camps, with an additional 2,000 dispersed across the island to live with family and friends. According to officials, evacuations took place without incident, despite the population feeling, quote, very discouraged and anxious. Though the governor received praise for his measures protecting the population, locals saw the eruption as a, a great consternation, uh, quote, consternation, and described the sub subsequent evacuation as, quote, the exodus of the population. The dislocation was immense, as this exodus had separated families from their homes and livelihoods. The once magnificent city, so hopeful just months earlier, attained, according to one observer, quote, the appearance of an abandoned necropolis. The cover of the, 20, uh, the October 27th edition of Le Petit Journal shows evacuating individuals carrying trunks and crates, loading wagons, and leading what livestock they could with the fuming volcano in the distance. These individuals were crestfallen, and the, arti the artist's rendition clearly shows such a sentiment. By and large, the region had taken a fatal blow to its prestige, and many complained that their property, belongings, and livelihood in Saint-Pierre were now worthless. One such individual, a merchant in Saint-Pierre for 20, for 20 years and father of six children, complained that the fruits of his labor in Saint-Pierre, the sum total of all his hard work and investments, had drastically depreciated since the eruptions began. Similarly arguing that the volcanic circumstances left him with, quote, heavy charges that he cannot repay, a plantation owner from Le Mont Rouge uh, had to abandon his home and relocate to Guadeloupe, incurring transport costs and harvest losses in, a, in excess of 18,000 francs in the process. Many wealthy merchants and growers who had felt the economic squeeze as the eruption stretched on and commerce declined felt that the aid commission, formed as the evacuations began, had not provided in their estimation equitable recompense for their losses, seeing themselves in the words of uh, one person from Saint-Pierre as, quote, the victims of injustice caused by the governmental aid commission who had, according to their pleasure, given large amounts to some and negligible aid to others. In fact, some felt that the government had betrayed them, such as one municipal employee with four daughters who felt particularly wronged because he had been brave enough to return to his post after the great eruption in 1902. The economic consequences of the eruption were widely felt across the northern half of the island. Harvests of cane, citrus, and fruit orchards had been completely destroyed by volcanic ash, while livestock were either killed, fled, or had to be abandoned. This left the island's laboring class unemployed in the north and the labor market oversaturated in the south. Faced with mounting economic hardship, petitions for aid inundated the colonial government and recalled the devastation of Pele's eruption 27 years earlier. Relief aid took the form of economic engineering, with officials looking to inject capital in such a way that would bolster the economy without draining the coffers. An equitable aid distribution had deep roots in the French Caribbean. Just decades earlier, during the hurricane of 1891, colonial investigators had carried on what they called a, quote, evaluative work that's not personal, but based on statistical givens, uh, in order to determine that local damage estimates in their minds were grossly inflated. 
This so-called evaluated, evaluative work also diverted the bulk of relief funds to the island's wealthiest planters. Ten years later, in the aftermath of the 1902 eruption, another aid commission had wished to avoid the indigence and laziness, and thus limited, uh, avoid indigence and laziness among the black laboring population, and thus limited direct aid to thousands of black men of working age, instead focusing on finding them employment. By contrast, the state had allocated a disproportionate amount of relief funds to students living in the metropole whose prominent families had died. The Aid Commission provided this disproportionate amount of, aid of, of, amount of assistance diverted from funds which could have gone to the truly indigent to, quote, assure this, these students a future and a career. So similarly drawing on the, quote, objectivity that they believed statistics engendered, officials in 1929 relied on what they called a proportional and mathematical system of disaster relief. In reality, however, relief efforts followed, uh, following 1929 dramatically demonstrated the unease with which officials dealt with the island population. Their fear of civil unrest, heightened by the island's burgeoning labor movement, their preference for aiding the upper crust of Martinique's society, and the bureaucratic distrust between the National Aid Commissions and their local counterparts, which the state considered prone to corruption. All seekers of public aid had to prove that they were, quote, refugees coming from the volcanic zone without resources and incapable of working. Women, the elderly, uh, those over 65, the sick and the infirm received five francs per day during their time as refugees, while children under the age of 16 received two francs per day. Men of working age, however, as in the earlier 1902 eruption, received no assistance from the state other than the government, quote, bureaus endeavoring to find them work. Most of this work was to be found rebuilding roads and reopening evacuation routes, a labor which officials found suitable, quote, for healthy men and women from evacuated regions. Employing the able body to build these evacuation routes could kill two birds with one stone, according to officials. By providing employment instead of direct aid to the able-bodied, the administration sought, not save, sought to save money in direct aid distributions while, in their words, quote, not encouraging laziness and instead pushing them to work. Economic engineering could help the indigent officials thought while at the same time rebuilding the island. Rebuilding the North never restored the Paris of the Antilles. Although locally elected officials had already been pushing to begin the rebuilding effort and had requested funds and permission to commence a number of public works by 1930, such requests were repeatedly denied. The volcanic zone was deemed to be too dangerous and the shelters deemed insufficient. With what was now seen as an established pattern of volcanic activity, colonial officials were loath to throw good money after bad. As the 1930s went on, officials restricted all nationally funded construction efforts to those buildings of an absolute public necessity, uh, damaged or destroyed during the eruption of 1929, and they expressly forbid or forbade new construction projects. For officials, the reawakening of Pele made it clear that the island should relocate its center of industry to the south. As one colonial scientist presciently explained in the years before the, the eruption, Quote, it is, not, it is necessary not to concentrate all of Martinique's industrial and co commercial activity at the foot of this famous volcano. It would be better to expand the port of Fort de France, making it perfectly equipped, a perfectly equipped modern port where all ships headed to the Pacific would dock. In the years following the eruption, relocation was all but assured, as the growth of Fort de France guaranteed the desolation of the foothills of Mount Pele for the next three quarters of a century. Now, I'll close. Uh, numerous books and articles in English as well as French have addressed the 1902 eruption, which takes its place prominently in present-day tourist brochures and travel guides. Remember, it was at the heart of the kind of burgeoning uh, or, 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 or uh, early tourism industry in Martinique itself. However, despite a flurry of interest and excitement at the time, today's literature and advertisements, as well as historical scholarship, are eerily silent regarding the lesser known eruption from 1929 to 1932, when so many individuals left their homes for uncertain futures in the South. The 1902 eruption greatly overshadows that of 1929, therefore. And in many respects, rightfully so, given that so many perished in 1902 and so few in 1929. 
However, the memory work done by Pele's 1902 eruption during its 1929 reawakening had ensured the physical safety of inhabitants of northern Martinique, but at the same time, it transformed a naturally occurring hazard into a societal disaster outright. A tragedy rooted in dislocation, disruption, and disparity, rather than in the, the sky-high death tolls of its predecessor. Officials had inherited the inequitable practices uh, employed uh, in approaches to disaster relief employed by their forebears uh, that ensured that those displaced from Saint Pierre and its environs lost not their lives but their livelihoods. They inherited attitudes that barred laborers from direct aid for fear of colonial laziness and fears that guaranteed the northern half of the island, so critical in the lives of so many, would never regain its former place as the Paris of the Antilles. Thanks.